i tēnei ahi ahi. Uh, huri noa atu ki a tātou katoa, uh, e ki nei uh, ngā mōrehu, uh, mō tēnei kaupapa, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So just briefly, uh, thank you uh, for the for that introduction and the reference to the sporting background is a, is a way of trying to explain my looks. I used to be six foot four <laughs> and handsome once upon a time. But uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, what I would like to do firstly is to acknowledge uh, the concept of the conference and to acknowledge uh, all of us who have gathered together uh, to engage in this uh, conversation over the last few days uh, and more importantly to welcome uh, add my welcome to those of you who have traveled from overseas to be here with us in New Zealand and in particular to acknowledge the very fine compliment of guest speakers that we've had to share with us at this conference and uh, we're, we're grateful that uh, many of you have uh, made the time to travel uh, to be with us here in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, of course I, I, I do want to acknowledge you Michael because I know that um, probably of all of us you should have been one of the people speaking at this conference on a platform like this given uh, um, the work that you've done and, and the things that you have uh, set up for others to do. So I um, just want to acknowledge that in the space that you've afforded the rest of us to speak uh, when you could so easily have uh, have uh, added also to uh, this uh, the, the number of presentations that we've had. So um, I want to uh, begin by uh, I guess a series of disclaimers and to acknowledge uh, colleagues from Te Whareiwananga o Awanui Arangi, uh, both students and students, to say that uh, they've allowed me to be up here today and to speak, but um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, there are many of our, uh, the complement of staff who are here today who uh, in their own right could could stand up here and, and do some of the things that I'm doing. So I'm um, uh, first amongst equals if you like and uh, probably have to carry that responsibility because I've got uh, a leadership role which I'm trying to deny. Uh, in the Wānanga. Um, <clears throat> probably, uh, and just to say that I enjoy my teaching and I certainly uh, don't see the idea of a CEO at a Wānanga uh, necessarily as an administrator only, uh, that uh, we have a responsibility to get out there and to get our hands dirty, if you like, in terms of the, the hard business of making the changes that need to occur. So uh, I want to, um, today, to share with you the story of Awanui Arangi, but along the way I want to uh, try and paint the picture of the theoretical and methodological contestation that is occurring as we struggle to uh, make space for the wānanga in the uh, setting of the educational provision in New Zealand. I want to also draw on my um, experience as a practitioner, as someone who has, uh, if you like, been hardened by the furnace of the uh, Kura Kaupapa Māori struggle, the language struggle in New Zealand, which is around about 30 years old now in New Zealand, the revitalisation movement, and uh, to build on the the teachings and the learnings, if you like, of a personal involvement in that movement and to share with you uh, where we're up to in that struggle, because that struggle actually permeates into other aspects of education, like the wānanga sector, like um, uh, the policy sector and so on. There are some quite specific learnings, I think, that we have developed from that early struggle that have stood the uh, test of time and are still informative of the way in which uh, we can make space and progress 
in uh, current conditions. So, um, in uh, just centering the, the idea of the involvement in the language struggle, I, I want to uh, just go back and start with some of the early platforming of the Kopapa Māori genesis or development. And uh, the idea, uh, very early on, uh, Linda and I sort of came to an agreement that she would go into the methodology, methodology area of research and I would go into the theory, theory element. So that, uh, you know, to keep, if you like, uh, family relations sort of uh, in check that we were in different areas and not in each other's space as it were. So, um, very early on, uh, one of my concerns was to try and understand the early uh, kohanga reo, the, the preschool language nest uh, development in New Zealand, which has become uh, uh, very famous and mythical in, in its achievements, and uh, various other uh, alternative uh, educational movements. Try and understand what the what the guts of these movements were in the sense of what was the transformative elements embedded inside these movements that we might be able to pick up and apply to develop change in a series of other sites. So really that was one of the key um, uh, pieces of work that I did uh, undertook in my um, PhD study which was uh, looked at um, Kopapa Māori as transformative praxis. Now, each of those words, using those in 1990, was pretty new. Uh, they've now become so, so um, uh, over, almost overused in the current context that I'm now uh, wanting to reflect on actually the, the way in which these terms are being used because in many instances I believe that they're being misused, uh, that there's been... Uh, a, a series of appropriations that have occurred and indeed uh, it's uh, leading to what I think is the domestication of the radical potential of these ideas. So there's, uh, I'm hoping in this discussion to uh, start to stimulate the renewal of these ideas as we look forward and uh, relate these ideas to the to the new context of the Wānana. So, um, in my, and I'll, I'll uh, this slide here hasn't come out, but basically I just acknowledge that the education struggle is dependent upon many people. I'm certainly just one of many people who have been involved. I like, when I'm talking about the early language struggle, to acknowledge Tuki Nepe, one of our early strugglers who, who gave her life she was a, a master student in the Auckland Education Department where uh, a few of us worked, Peter Roberts and others worked there uh, with uh, Mike. And uh, she died very early uh, in, her, um, in, uh, in her career, uh, but she was a fundamental uh, contributor to the development of uh, these early language uh, initiatives. So her and others, uh, important in the work that I'm talking about. I don't want to claim that space uh, just uh, around the work that I'm doing. I'm, I'm a, as Michael Apple has often said, uh, it's important for many of us to be the secretaries for the people and, and that's how I see the work that I do in my contribution. So in my early uh, PhD work I um, by a process of aggregation, looking at a number of sites and questioning uh, a number of parents as to why they made these choices of putting their kids into this alternative education option of the preschool uh, language initiative, given that to do so was at great risk, that there was no precedent for this. It was also, if you like, uh, frowned upon by uh, other conservative elements in our community. And after a process of getting all the feedback, I came up with six key principles that why parents made these decisions. 
And so the first one was Tinoranga Tiritanga. They, they wanted to have uh, feel that they had more control over the say of what happened to the education uh, of their children. Mataonga Tuku Iho, that they wanted to maintain uh, the, the cultural uh, elements, of, uh, the, the important elements of our culture and uh, through uh, opportunities uh, at school. Ako Māori, that they wanted to, their kids to learn uh, surrounded by the values or the pedagogies that reinforced the, the cultural preferences of the home environment in there and so on. Kia pikiaki e ngā radudaru o te kainga. This is very significant. They also said, because many of them are from uh, 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 poor families or uh, um, underdeveloped community contexts, and so many of them expressed it this way, that they wanted their children to have better opportunities than they had in terms of their participation in the community life and so on. And I've interpreted that as the... Uh, they wanted to intervene in the socio-economic circumstances of their kids. And I'll just pause here and just explain this a little bit more because it's important. Right, so at this time we had all of these descriptions of, you know, the, uh, the economic impediment, the relationship between economics, economic underdevelopment and poor schooling outcomes. Everyone could describe that but very few people would come up with an answer that would actually make the difference. So I, I would say that in one of the things that we were arguing at this time, that the, uh, our cultural propensity towards collectivity, towards sharing our resources, towards mobilising our cultural social capital helped to mediate the worst effects of the socio-economic impediment. And that's, uh, you know, while that's a mouthful, that's actually quite a tricky thing to do, but it's actually a major component. So we're, we're not saying that we were able to overthrow the economic impediment, but we could certainly argue that there was a, a mediation of the worst effects of this by our ability to mobilise our social, cultural and social capital elements. So that's a part that's in this. Farno, the extended family, uh, idea that, uh, and this again was a key uh, intervention in the sense of pr if we could develop the responsibilities and the reciprocity elements of the extended family, then you've got this opportunity to grow the social capital support network. And kaupapa, which was the shared vision element. So you can see some of these things starting to overlap, if you like, with, with the critical theory. Now, I haven't said anything really about, about Paulo yet, but at this time, um, while I'm doing this stuff, I, I uh, uh, start to read things like Pedagogy of the Press and hear and read other papers from uh, Freire uh, Influence. And uh, like others, very you know, dramatic um, engagement in the sense that Freire just simply described everything that was happening to us, gave us a, a, a un, more universal language to talk about these things, to be able to co-opt, if you like, a wider group of, of collaborators who would work, who worked in the same area and so on. And so uh, I sort of voraciously took up Freire, and if you read my PhD, you'll find it replete with uh, references to him. And I'd also acknowledge Antonia at the, uh, this point as well because uh, Antonia and I shared Michael Apple in our background with our thesis work and so uh, Michael was making me uh, refer to papers and elements that Antonia was writing because she was one of his students at the time. So all of this has come the full circle if you like if we, as we uh, uh, meet at this meeting. So uh, those are the, the key elements that I thought if we could pick them up, they were an intervention uh, package. And uh, one of the key things that I did was to say, this is kopapa Māori theory, and simply pulled the word theory out of the air and packed it on the back of this and said, this is a transforming theory. 
And people have, haven't understood uh, often why I did that, because I keep saying, you can't call that theory. What are you doing? That theory's got... And uh, for the most part, it, it does, you know, fulfill things like it, it uh, provides a universal sort of engagement. It, it provides uh, um, the ability to pick up something and to apply it in another place and get the same sort of result. So it had some of the attendant features of theory, but I fully admit it wasn't totally theory in the accepted sense. But the reason that I did it was because I wanted to challenge the academy. Because the academy controlled basically the fundamentals of what counted as significant knowledge. And theory is the raison d'etre of the academy. And that was the reason I, I, I've done this and stuck by it. And then over time, it's actually, in my view, turned into a very important theory of transformation. So uh, let's now, that was then. So now I want to jump to today because, as I intimated earlier, uh, there, in my view, has been a proliferation of the usages of the words kopapa Māori, of transformative praxis and other things. So now I'm, I'm uh, of the view that I want to call people to account for how they're using these terms because the obvious is happening that, that we're seeing the misuse of these terms which in turn lead to its domestication of its radical potential. So uh, part of my um, uh, current uh, concern is how do we renew the power of these original concepts within the new, within the new uh, place that we're at at the moment. So I've said that there ought to be five tests for the veracity of kopapa Māori as a transforming praxis. And uh, these, are, these are the elements. So I'll sort of try and build out some of these things um, as we talk about them. But first thing is criticality, um, and by that I mean we need to understand the context of unequal power relations in which we, which we exist. Again, I'm just reinforcing what Antonia, Peter and others have said. Uh, and I think that's a good thing because we're, we're all in tune. But the criticality element here in the New Zealand context uh, is, is significant because we see the reproduction of, of uh, the status quo and dominant interests through um, uh, various processes that need to be engaged with. So the other side of this, that it is no good, right, learning and, uh, you know, uh, critical strategies and, and so on, if we don't know the context in which we're working, the environment that we're trying to respond to. In other words, it's like a plug. The plug has got to fit if we're going to deal and make a deal with the impediments, if you like, that are uh, forming over the top of us, or the colonisation that's forming, or the oppression, whichever word you want to use. We need ways to be able to read that correctly. Now, this connects with uh, Colin Lancashire's concept of improper literacies. Now, if we haven't got the right critical literacies, then our work is always going to come up short. Right. So we need to be able to to understand it. So there's a lot of elements that come with, fall within the ambit of, you know, understanding unequal power relations and how that forms. But one of the concepts is, this is just one element, which I call uh, new formations of colonisation. And the idea that colonisation has not gone away. We've understood colonisation in, in the traditional forms. The churches did it to us, the schools did it to us, and the state did it to us. And that has served us pretty well over the years as we've engaged. But I have to uh, unfortunately announce, for those of you who have not caught this idea yet, colonisation has not gone away. It has simply changed form. And we really need to understand, if you like, the new formations of colonisation. Now, most of it has been formed in what I call the intersection of cultural oppression and economic exploitation. In other words, it's the neoliberal formation that's come in behind and has captured, if you like. So we're into things like commodification of knowledge, to wit, 
the great deal of work that's going on now in terms of intellectual and cultural property rights. Not in terms of protecting ind indigenous knowledge. Actually, intellectual and cultural property rights is about exploiting mm. knowledge. It's about, um, you know, uh, 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 the free market idea, if you like, in terms of the way in which knowledge might be exploited more fully in concepts such as the knowledge economy and so on, which of course in trouble in Ireland and various other places, but no one's made the announcement that knowledge economy has not worked. Um, you know, to things such as domestication of our mindset and the way that we think through hegemony, and I note that there's a number of, of presentations made at the conference around counter-hegemonic action and so on, which is a fundamental component of the criticality that we need to engage. And, you know, um, I, would, I would say that you know, it's just as important as speaking truth to power, that we need to speak truth to common sense. We need to unpack uh, a large amount of what we take as the taken for granted way of doing things. So, um, other, other forms of, um, of, of, uh, of um, uh, new formations of colonisation, uh, indebtedness, right? And uh, particularly for Māori, that, that indebtedness is carried unequally in our society. And, um, you know, things like the, the rise and the emergence of the techno-rational uh, ideology through STEM, you know, the sciences and uh, science reification and so on. But probably the most devastating element uh, for me is the notion of the possessive individual. The capitalistic notion that, uh, you know, basically everybody is selfish. And that, uh, you know, the idea that individual freedoms, individual rights are paramount. I mean, this is fundamental to the neoliberal equation. And why that's a new form of colonization for us is that for Māori and for other indigenous peoples, we still need to act collectively. Our investment in the collective of the extended family in terms of our notions of tribe and so on, that uh, our uh, ownership of property is often collective, uh, our uh, resources and so on, we have a collective responsibility. There is a tension here between those two notions. And so uh, the, the idea of individualism and the way it's uh, positioned as being uh, you know, significant in our policy framework in New Zealand in particular needs to be challenged as, a, as I say, a new form of colonisation. So, the, so if criticality is important, um, structures and cultural considerations, I won't go into all of these because some of them were explored, you know, uh, Antonia and Peter uh, Roberts and others have, have sort of positioned some of this stuff already. But you get the idea that our struggle is not about our culturalist uh, elements alone. Right? It's not just about the people stuff. It's also about the deep structures in our in our um, in our society, and how they impact on our on our well-being. So our resistance, if you like, needs to speak to both of those elements equally, well, not equally, but I think uh, certainly um, uh, effectively. Now, pos positionality is another test that I'm asking of everyone. And positionality is really where do you speak from when you make your claims about Kopapa Māori? and about, um, you know, transforming. Show me the blisters on your hands. Talk to me in the past tense about not what you're going to do, but what you have done. And I want to, uh, you know, sort of centralise that kind of notion. Now, in saying that, I'm not decrying, you know, that I'm not trying to pick up on the, on the uh, contestation between theory and practice, right? Because some of the blisters on the hands come from people who write powerful words. Right? I hope you get my drift here, is that the pen can also be a powerful enactment element and a practice. But what I'm talking about here are uh, those who write from a distance, 
who continue to write in the third voice. And I heard, heard uh, I think it was Antonia this morning, mention the idea of, uh, you, you know, it's, it's really what we, what we would say from our perspective, putting yourself in your, in your thesis. No. Not, not, not uh, just accepting the idea of objectivity and subjectivity as being, you know, bad things. You know, I ask all my students, put yourself in, in this thesis. Where it, you know, show me your connectedness to this work. And let's leave it up to the reader to decide whether or not you've been subjective or, you know, neutral, whatever. And export that responsibility that way, rather than the academy trying to build false, uh, you know, uh, uh, understandings that somehow everyone is absolutely neutral and objective around their work that they're doing. So these are, these are different things, but the positionality thing is, is a really important challenge because I feel that too many people make the claim that they've uh, done the Kopapa Māori long trek, the hard yards, and they really haven't, or they haven't done the reading appropriately. And, uh, and of course, the downside of this is that they undermine the power of, this, of these uh, tools. Um, the other thing is that, and a little bit of that here today, so I want to remind even some of our own staff from our institution as we reflect with each other, because part of this, as you notice, is it's a critical reflection on what we're doing, but is the idea that, that um, our position is, you know, needs to be open-ended. Right? Our work is... Uh, transform we should speak about transforming rather than transformation I've moved away I used to use the word transformation in the title of this piece I've called it transforming education right now that's the, that title is ambiguous and I mean both senses of the ambiguity that it is about an outcome and it is about a process education should be transforming and as, as an outcome but we should also be transforming in the process of it. And um, so that idea of transforming as a verb rather than a noun is deliberate. Because what, what I'm talking about is the ongoing enactment of our work. Our work for transforming never stops. All right, so that's part of the, uh, I would say transformation is a noun, it's the utopian vision down the road. More of that later. Praxis, again, I won't dwell on this. We've, we've uh, had a good go at this uh, over the past few days, but the idea of you know, uh, action, cent centralising action, that has uh, been reflected on and, the, uh, and a continuous process, ongoing reflection and uh, re reflex, Sean. And finally, uh, transforming. And again, um, you know, I want to say that there's not enough work put into the notion of transforming. A lot of people drop the word change, they drop, we, they name drop transforming, but they've got no deep or profound understanding of what they mean by that and how you actually get transforming and how do you know when you get there and what counts as transforming and so on. It's just dropped that somehow change is a magic uh, outcome. So uh, I'm going to speak more about how I think about trans transformation and transforming uh, in a moment. But um, I want to say that the, uh, in this 1980s movement of the alternative schools in New Zealand since the 1980s, that this was a revolution in education in New Zealand, but that the revolution that occurred in New Zealand wasn't kohanga reo, the preschool language nest, it wasn't the Kurakopapa of Māori. It wasn't the Wānanga. They are all outward visible manifestations of a deeper revolution that's occurred for Māori. And that deeper revolution is up here. It was a change in mindset, a shift away from waiting for things to happen to us to actually doing things for ourselves. And someone talked uh, uh, this morning about the notion of the politics of disengagement. 
as a strategy, as much as the politics of engagement. Uh, they're important. Actually, I can tell you that when we pulled away and started doing things independently, people couldn't, you know, we had people trying to get in the windows to see what was going on. They all wanted to participate. But prior to that, as Antonia had noted, had noted about the uh, Tucson situation, you know, we were accused of being separatists, of being, doing, you know, that the world would fall apart because we were, you know, drawing away and developing our own schools and so on. And so I'm pleased to announce in uh, 2012 that the world has not fallen apart. <laughs> New Zealand's still going. And um, everyone seems to be a little bit happier about where we've got to around our language and vitalisation and so on. Okay, so uh, as far as indigenous underdevelopment is concerned, and again, I'm using underdevelopment quite deliberately here because I want to position that, that the, uh, this is not victim blaming or deficit stuff uh, necessarily about Māori being responsible for this, but there's also a possibility that the state policy and other uh, public entities may be implicated in this. But we need to really, un you know, uh, not understand, but to draw the connection between what we're doing here in terms of, of our educational struggle. And, and, you know, I think we need to underline that our educational struggle is intimately connected with the repositioning of our socio-economic life chances as Māori in New Zealand. It is critical. We will not have a sustainable socio-economic revolution for Māori in our communities without a simultaneous or prior educational revolution. Uh, this has gone a little bit all over the place, but as an institution, Awanui Arangi is, um, we, we want to work both in and through education. All right, so we do things a little bit different in our uh, arena. So we still uh, celebrate our graduations and so on, but we do it differently. Um, we walk right down the middle of our town as an institution and have our own parade and so on and celebration. We are an institution that uh, is, has these twin aims of, and I've deliberately co-opted the word excellence I'm well aware of the neoliberal connotation of that word, but we've, we've grabbed hold of it because we have these twin targets that we want our students to have the skills to fit them for, someone said it earlier, Māori citizenship. Māori still want to be Māori. Māori still have responsibilities to participate in cultural elements where they need skills of language, skills of understanding the cultural frameworks, and so on. But we also want, you know, our parents want exactly the same as other parents. They want the best education for their kids as well. So it's not either or, but our uh, uh, system too often, not everywhere, but too often creates the choice where it's only one choice. You take what's on the table, and it's usually a monocultural uh, education element and there's not this duality to the building of it. So we have a significant um, um, uh, graduate school uh, there and I'll say something more about that later on with um, about uh, an Awanu Yarangi. But uh, just to quicken this up a bit. Okay, so can you wave me down with about um, 10 minutes to go please? So uh, our institution uh, is 20 years old and we're opening a big uh, new campus in Whakatane, but we grew from nothing. How do you start a wānanga? I've been asked that question. You get a board, four nails, a pot of paint and a hammer. You look around for an empty building and you occupy it. <laughs> you, write a, you write your name on the board and you nail it up on the wall. <laughs> and that's a true story. That's how we started at Awanuyara 20 years ago. And uh, so we had teachers that, that came from
from volunteers from uh, different universities. Not all Māori, actually, and many from the University of Auckland, colleagues, uh, to support that development. So some points of difference, of, uh, I won't dwell on this, but and I won't dwell on the 360 approach because I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but there's a number of things that we are engaged with uh, as an institution that, are, that have a different connotation. Right, rurality rather than rural is a, a concept that the, the reality of being rural so we don't want to be the mirror image of the urban-rural dichotomy. It's about how we position ourselves in terms of a self-development process. Okay, so we won't dwell on that. So what I want to talk about um, is really this, uh, uh, the shift in the way we've conceptualised our change model, our change process. So essentially, uh, most people conceptualise change as a linear sort of process. A to B to C, very instrumental. Um, and when you construct this sort of very instrumental uh, um, uh, portrayal of change, you construct hierarchies. All right? There's a hierarchy implicit in this model of change. Because you can't do B unless you've done A. And you can't do C unless you've done A and B. And when you construct the hierarchy in the, the, the idea of uh, transformational change, you construct the ability to divide and rule. And that has been a, 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 a great um, uh, impediment for getting unity amongst Māori. Because when we've been talking about uh, you know, uh, development of language uh, revitalization, you had Bilingual schools saying that this is the way to do it. You had immersion schools saying this is the way to do it. And you had a whole lot of people competing, if you like, for the small resource, all claiming to have the right pathway or, if you like, the um, uh, ownership of the transforming uh, ideal. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we've had to face in our community is the potential for divide and rule amongst ourselves. And so one of the pieces of, uh, or one of the concerns that I've had for some time is how do we construct a more unified struggle which has got everybody apart for everybody to play rather than contesting, you know, with groups saying, God, is she on the tr on, in the struggle or what? You know, what's wrong with her, him? Or, you know, and all of this sort of backbiting which divides, divides ourselves. And very cunningly, um, you know, uh, fostered also by policy and by uh, the uh, state funds, which are, you get a small amount, you throw it in the middle and watch the lolly scramble. So that's the linear sort of uh, formation. What I uh, want to, uh, as, a, as a model for, for transforming, is to shift away, create, if you like, a, a more circular model, put the arrows going both ways between these things. And then what I can say is that I can plot every Māori in New Zealand somewhere in this circle. Right? Now, some are asleep, some are going backwards, but hopefully most are going in the right direction. But they're all in the struggle. And this is my point here, is that that it's important for us to uh, find ways that, that create that, that unity in what we do. Now, I should say that, you know, while I use the Freerian sort of conscientisation, uh, resistance and transforming sort of notions about, about changes, and this is uh, really a tribute to uh, one of Peter's students, uh, recently marked a thesis, and, you know, so the idea of conscientisation, I want to be more... Uh, deliberate about what that means because uh, the, the thesis that I, I looked at by David Liu uh, posited the positioning of the moral and ethical position of the individual around the term conscience. So the relationship between conscience and consciousness, right, 
surrounds the idea of conscientization, because conscientization, if you like, mediates those two concepts, the conscience of the individual to the consciousness of the collective action. Uh, it's a really important uh, 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 insight for me because I think our argument for more moral and ethical leadership about what we're doing is significant and needs to be recentered in that kind of thinking. So, um, so we're shifting to a model. We're, we're doing a circle not because I'm indigenous. It just so happens it was a circle. <laughs> just a happy coincidence. <coughs> um, but I also want to talk about the idea of uh, renewing struggle. Because one of the things that we've been caught up with is that we've invested a whole lot of change in a model and then people have got tired or the vision is seen as utopian and people have fallen off the struggle along the way and so on. So we need to also think about the, what I call the idea of renewal. And really, uh, uh, you know, there's a couple of ideas here that I've brought together from Claus Offey around the legitimation crisis cycle, who's you know, basically arguing every four years you have to do, uh, you know, there's courses of crisis for the states and so on at the election box and so on. But the idea of, uh, you know, marrying it with the reconstruction of the Frankfurt School Project with Habermas is really important to me because the critical theory element underpinning what we're doing is also significant. And uh, the idea there that, you know, we need to think about the utopian vision as being down there. Utopian vision gives direction and impetus to struggle, right? But we shouldn't see it as necessarily the end result, that we need to celebrate the small incremental victories along the way to the utopian vision. Now that's really important about how we main, maintain momentum in the change process and struggle. So we need to think about these things. Then furthermore, and I'm going to stop after this, so that we get some time to engage. Um, and I might just flick through the rest of the photos so you get an idea of the wānanga. But the idea here is, where we've moved to in the wānanga, is the idea of the 360 intervention model. And what we're saying here is that our struggle is not one struggle. Our struggle is many struggles. And again, this is the idea of the plug-in. Right, so if the water's pouring through the dam, Remember the story of the, of, the, of the little Dutch boy putting his fingers in and trying to block up all the holes and the water's still coming through. You know, it's not just one finger that we need to put in the hole then when we're talking about colonisation, when we're talking about oppression and so on. There are many sites of struggle. Now this is important because what I want to do, going back to the inclusive diagram, that circular praxis model, is to say Every struggle is important, no matter how big or how small. We need to honour and make space for everybody's contribution. Right? Now, there's room for critique about doing it better, but I believe that, that we've got too divided, and particularly in academia, where, we, you know, where the old way of doing things was you cut the new scholars to pieces as much as you can, slice and dice them, and then leave them in a big mess on the floor and think that's added to my scholarly <laughs> reputation. There are different ways of doing things. And Awanui models a different way, and you would have noticed some of that here today, about how you build up everybody, how you grow a contribution. Right? Now, I'm not saying that there's people who don't deserve every now and again to be you know, brought down a peg or two and so on. But it shouldn't be the main way that we do our academic work. There are other ways to do it. So this is the idea here of that we need many uh, people engaging in many sites so on. Okay, I'm going to finish there, but I'll just flick through some, some of the things. That used to be the old school of the Wānanga. We are placed in Whakatāne, down in the... In the uh, we live in a, I like to tell when I'm overseas, I tell everyone we're in a resort town <laughs> as opposed to we're in a hip town in the country. You know? <laughs> we live by the sea. And it's a very strong cultural environment and uh, has a deep embedded history. But it's also an environment 
that has uh, got other issues. So we're about uh, 3,500 Fs, which translates to about 5,000 students. Uh, with 180 academic staff, we have three schools, an undergraduate school, a graduate school, and a tribal development school. Uh, that's how we, and we have four institutes, post-treaty settlement institute, national institute for Māori education, etc. We have a critical mass of Māori PhD qualified staff and uh, more professors now and so on. And, but we have a significant group of programs that are building community within the community at Marae sites. Our student profile is, you can see, is tough. You don't get paid any more than the conventional institutions are being paid. They get the same heft to deal with students that they can select at the gate because they raise the GPA for entry, so they're dealing with the most successful students. Having said that, Awanui Arangi over the last year produced one-fifth of the total Māori undergraduate students with a degree in New Zealand. Just gives you a little bit of an insight there. So we in an area, health deprivation, we're the worst case scenario in New Zealand. So red is the worst case, deep red is the worst case example there. We're hemorrhaging all over the place. Uh, our land, uh, the land from this iwi was confiscated by the government in the 1860s and here's the rub and the contradiction, given 10,000 acres given to endow the University of Auckland at New Zealand. And so there is a deep, if you like, uh, historical um, issue that needs to be dealt with. Schooling, if I didn't say this was New Zealand, you'd think it was uh, native uh, Australia or native Canada and so on. We've had a, a, we took the government to task and won, and we had a tribal settlement which has allowed us to build our own buildings and to not be dependent on the government. So we have a sort of a limited autonomy. I, I would say that we do not have full autonomy and uh, because we still pick up the government check for the Fs and so on. With that, uh, there's still things that we need to be uh, cognizant of. So we, the treaty won't deliver our, our rights and our change of conditions. We're in the Education Act and you'll see there that we're expected to be the peers of universities and to do what universities do. Okay. So we teach all the way to doctorate level. Every student is required to do critical studies in the Wainanga. The Matatua Declaration on uh, Intellectual and Cultural Property Rights, which is now a UN document, came out of the Wainanga. We understand the neoliberal tensions, and I won't go into that uh, today, but uh, again, all of those elements are problematic, including democracy. The argument's not against democracy, it's against the manipulation of democracy that uh, often occurs, and, uh, and so on. All of those things others have talked about. Uh, I would raise the issue of the politics of truth, and this is something that we talk about amongst ourselves as Indigenous scholars about Again, the, re the reflecting ourselves on what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, but, you know, we need to understand our limits, limitations. No one is pure in the struggle. We need to understand that. And at various points we're making compromises and so on. But the trick is, you've got to know if you're making a compromise and, and where you're doing that, as opposed to being unknowing about it. Etc., etc. Beyond the mystification of culture. We don't hold culture up as a way to create gates and blockages for, for, for others. Beyond deficit theory, that was explained this morning. But beyond this more insidious thing called self-esteem theory, again, and Tony explained this this morning, so we're all on the same page here. You know, this is about the little bit of culture. We'll put a dash of culture in, but it, this, the same old uh, uh, curriculum is being serviced by this little dash of culture. So when I went to school, this was the map, learn this map well, 
you pass the national exam. But there's another map of New Zealand which is embedded in our Māori language. There's a different geography that's in our language. This is, at, uh, uh, is one of the things that's at stake if we lose our language and so on. Indigenous theorising, we're, we're doing this as well at the Wananga. And again, not an either or. We're, in order to hold a position of Indigenous theorising, you've got to know theory more generally. That's why, why uh, um, uh, Borden's talking about Heidegger and Gadamer and others because you need to know the spaces that you're occupying, right, if you're moving away from others. So we use Western theories and we use our own theories for, because from time to time we need some tools that help us understand our particular context. It's not either or. Learning and teaching, doing our own pedagogies, we just take that for granted. You know, understanding this whole, uh, the, the, the construction of uh, the testing regime and so on. <coughs> We do a number of research projects, but all of those projects are questions, really, that we want to ask. They're not entrepreneurial questions that are servicing some of the big machinery of government or other elements. We're into technology. We have an after-school program, 300 kids. Don't tell me Māori parents aren't interested in their kids doing education. My street, because I live opposite this place, is just covered with cars at 6.30 at night of Māori parents picking up their kids from, from this after-school program. And that's a public good activity. It's not, we're not paid to do that. We're engaging with other institutions. We're not a, an island unto ourselves. This is part of our new building structure that's, that we're opening on December the 7th. Again, uh, just say that we own our whole, this, whole, this whole element ourselves. So graduate school, again, 60-odd uh, doctoral students, over 200 master students there. You know, a significant cluster of Māori graduate students in one place. We put our students back in the community through postdoctoral post scholarships that are set with tribes. We're international, work in several countries including in India. So the 80 million indigenous tribal peoples in India. Uh, and we've had a significant development around the Māori PhD development program that's travelled widely over overseas, it's in Canada, it's in the States, it's in uh, Hawaii. And that program here began in New Zealand and it was uh, targeted at developing 500 Māori PhDs in five years. It took us seven years to achieve that, but it's been done. So it's a similar program uh, developed in Canada. Right, and these, I would have to say, if I had time to explain, I could show you some of the Freerian concepts of learning that are actually embedded inside that, that way of learning and teaching. Again, uh, we're influencing several, you know, in different places, different countries. And there's just some of the doctors that have been developed in New Zealand. Just to give you an idea, when I did my doctorate, I was probably the only one, only Māori in New Zealand to graduate that year. Last year we graduated 65 Māori doctorates. So that's all I wanted to say. And again, uh, just to finish off, the, thank you uh, uh, for putting up with me. And I, I know I've pushed the, you know, uh, quite a few slides at you, but I think that's the best way for you to capture the things that I'm talking about. So we're a very positive story. Uh, we're here to stay. We have a contribution to make and we need you to help us. Kia ora. Thank you.